Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, when your heart stops, facts about sudden cardiac arrest. Sudden cardiac arrest is a major public health problem. It affects about 1,000 people outside hospital settings every day in the United States. When sudden cardiac arrest occurs, the heart stops beating without warning and can lead to death in minutes if the person does not get help right away. However, with immediate bystander recognition and intervention, the odds of survival are greatly improved. Today on Health360 with Dr. G, we are talking facts about sudden cardiac arrest and why taking time to learn cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, and how to use an automated external defibrillator, AED, could mean the difference between life and death for a loved one. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle and Medicine. Check me out on, across all the socials at health 360 wdrg and visit me on my website at health360podcast.com. We have a great show for you today. And before you meet my guests, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a Healthy Driven Podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's get after it, y'all. We're going to be talking about cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest, and I have an amazing guest today. And it's a perfect segue into the month of February, which is American Heart Awareness Month. So I want to introduce my guest today, a longtime friend, colleague. He's taking care of many of my patients. I want to introduce you to Dr. Moeen Saleem. Let me read you his credentials because his credentials run deep. Dr. Moeen Saleem is a double board certified cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist. He's with Midwest Cardiovascular Institute. He's also the director of the electrophysiology lab at Edward Hospital. Dr. Moeen, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about uh, our discussion tonight. Uh, I'm glad we had a chance to run into each other and uh, come up with this idea uh, over That's dinner. And I, I enjoyed enjoyed having dinner with you that night as well. Um, so thank you, Doc. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Every comic book here yeah. has an origin story. Dr. Celine, where did you grow up? Um, undergrad, med school, residency, fellowship, and why this topic is so important to you? Yeah, yeah. So I, um, well, I've been in practice at Edward Hospital for almost 20 years. Um, but prior to that, uh, I was actually born in Canada. My father was a physician. Um, and um, from there, we moved to South Carolina, where I went to undergrad in medical school at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. And from there, moved to Chicago and did my medicine uh, training at Rush, along with a fellowship in cardiology and a chief residency uh, year at Rush. Uh, why Chicago? Well, my lovely wife is from Chicago, and together, uh, we have five kids. She's in practice at Elmhurst as a podiatrist. And um, I did my electrophysiology training at Northwestern. And then in 2004, finished up my fellowship and came out to Edward Hospital and uh, been here ever since. Love the community, love the hospital, and uh, love being an electrician for the heart. <laughs> well, again, I can tell it for sure, genuinely, because you've uh, been blessed to know you for a number of years now, but also just blessed to share patients and, uh, and my patients always do great um, what you do. And so just thank you and your team. And I'm glad again, we can have this discussion today. So there you have it, everybody. You just met Dr. Salim and really how the show works. I ask the questions. Doc's going to give some amazing answers. This topic is so pertinent right now, and I can't wait to just dive deeper with you. So, of course, grab your pen and paper. You know, when it comes to your know, health, we want you, me and my amazing uh, physician guests that have been on this that have been on this show, we want you to be the best version of yourself to live long and healthy lives. So take questions, you know, write down questions and talk to your doc again. He or she can be there for you to answer questions and help you along the way. So, doc. We call it the chief complaint when somebody comes into our office. The chief complaint, uh, of course, as the question of the hour is this. What should the public know about sudden cardiac arrest? So, Doc, let me frame this discussion for you, because sudden cardiac arrest has been thrust into the national spotlight. So we knew that it was thrust instantly into the spotlight on, on national TV, on live TV on January 2nd, when Buffalo Bills professional football player DeMar Hamlin collapsed on the field after tackling Cincinnati Bengals player T. Higgins. Thankfully, the team's medical personnel immediately jumped into action, performing CPR on Hamlin for nine minutes to restore his heartbeat 
actions which Hamlin's doctors credited for saving his life. He may be on the mend, but his recovery is far from over. And per his spokesman, he, quote, still requires oxygen and is having his heart monitored regularly to ensure there are no setbacks or after effects. So here's my first question for you, Doc, because so pertinent. How unique is Damar Hamlin's situation as it relates to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? Well, it was, uh, I think, certainly a, a captivating moment on national TV where, you know, many of us are just trying to uh, unwind and enjoy uh, sports as spectators and admire these uh, amazing athletes who we look upon as being in the best of the best in terms of physical fitness. So when something like that happens, uh, it's, it's, it's unexpected when it happens to anybody in the community, but certainly on national television to uh, an elite athlete. And uh, it has certainly brought attention to this topic that we're discussing tonight. And, and you know, as you mentioned, we decided on this topic months ago, and uh, here we are, it's, 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 even more, it's even more pertinent to the moment. Um, as far as the situation with DeMar Hamlin, well, first of all, we're all grateful to see that he um, uh, has survived this event, yes. has, has walked yes. out of the hospital, and we'll talk about more, uh, talk more yes. about that as to Please. why it happened. You know, getting back to this happening in an athlete, um, you know, the, the incidence or likelihood of this happening to an athlete is you know, one in, uh, you know, uh, 50,000 to 80,000 high school athletes may have a cardiac arrest, one in 15,000 or so college athletes. You know, when it comes to young people, the incidence of cardiac arrest is about 5,000 events a year. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a very rare occurrence in young people. As far as athletes go, there's probably 100 events a year. Uh, and then we can get into the different causes and speculative um, discussion uh, of, of what may have happened specifically with DeMar Hamlin, but then young people in general, and then look at other causes of cardiac arrest across the general population. I appreciate that. Let's let's dive a little bit deeper because I know uh, you were actually the first person, you actually reached out to me. You sent me a text. I had no idea what was going on. I actually was not watching the game. I was actually preparing for another episode of Health 360 with Dr. G at the time. So I'm sitting there on my computer and then all of a sudden you send me a text and you kind of basically say like, like Mark, you, you know, you know, did you see what happened? You know, you know, cardiac arrest. And I'm, and I'm like, what, what happened? Uh, so you got me away from my computer and I needed that break, by the way, but it allowed us and you and I were texting back and forth. So, of course, um, you know, us being outside observers, uh, although we do not truly know its cause, many of our professional colleagues have suggested a term called commotio cordis. So, Doc, uh, I mean, without knowing, again, you know, you and I were not part of DeMar Hamlin's treatment team, but, but, but can you explain what commotio cordis is and who's at risk? Sure. Um, so getting back to, you know, the causes of cardiac arrest in young Thanks. people, um, you know, 5,000 events a year, um, about 100 of those may be athletes. Doesn't always happen while playing sports. Uh, sometimes it can happen away from sporting activities. But when they looked at the potential causes of cardiac arrest in young people, in this country, in the U.S., the most common cause is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, there are other disorders, um, uh, long QT syndrome, um, which is a, a form, uh, it's, it, it's, a, a, um, it's a genetic condition where patients can be prone to uh, cardiac arrhythmias that can be lethal. Um, there can be um, conditions where other conditions where there can be enlargement of the heart muscle and heart chamber, such as cardiomyopathy. Just yeah. to step aside before we get into commodio oh, cortis, yeah. when I introduce myself to patients, uh, I, I usually tell people, think of your heart as like a house. And if you break it down that way, then you can sort of compartmentalize the different causes of cardiac arrest. So if you think of your heart as like a house, the heart muscle is the structure and the foundation. Um, the blood flow to the heart muscle, that's your plumbing. And the heart valves are the doors that open and close as part of that structure. And then your heartbeat runs through an electrical network. And uh, so you can, a person can experience cardiac arrest if there's a disorder of the structure and function of the heart muscle. Uh, there could be a plumbing problem, such as a blockage of an artery, and then the electrical problems like uh, long QT syndrome, WPW, uh, and other uh, inherited uh, causes where people can be prone to arrhythmias. 
Now, commodio cordis, interestingly, ironically, is a condition where cardiac arrest occurs in a normal healthy host. So we sort of step outside of the list of causes of uh, cardiac arrest where there might be some inherent or intrinsic problem of the heart to uh, it happening to a healthy host. And what happens with commodio cordis is uh, there is some type of um, uh, force or contact, usually through some type of projectile object like a baseball, a lacrosse ball, uh, martial arts, uh, that strikes the chest where it can affect the heart at a very narrow critical window within the cardiac cycle, 10 to 30 milliseconds within the cardiac cycle that can trigger a lethal arrhythmia called ventricular fibrillation. And once that occurs, it's treated and managed just like any other cardiac arrest scenario where you have to, uh, you have to recognize what's happened, you have to initiate an emergency uh, action plan and start CPR as we saw uh, on TV that night. Now in football, it, it's, it's exceedingly rare. I mean, in general, commodio cordis incidence is about 30 times a year. And in football, it's almost unheard of because the, the, the pads on the chest usually will disperse the physical energy of contact into the chest uh, compared to something uh, a more projectile missile-like object that uh, you, one may experience if they're struck by a baseball or a lacrosse ball, or again, in martial arts fighting. Uh, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. And so those of us watching TV might've speculated on that, but only the physicians that were taking care of him uh, would be able to conclude this. So the, when somebody has an episode of cardiac arrest, we have to go through a long checklist of why. Why did this happen? And we run a series of tests. And only after we've gone through exhaustive testing uh, may we conclude through exclusion that this was the cause. You know, it's unlikely, you know, you mentioned about, you know, I think about other common causes of cardiac arrest, uh, you know, heart attack, coronary artery disease. You mentioned heart valve disease. Um, you know, you mentioned conditions that cause the heart to beat in, un, in, a, in an unorganized way. You, you know, it's it's just like this thing just 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 caught us. And I would say when when something happens, and of course the good thing is that he survived, but there could be so much opportunity to create more awareness from such a traumatic event. But the reality is that um, these cardiac arrests happen, you know, all the time. I mean, we mentioned in my opening comments about a thousand people a day outside of the hospital and seven out of 10 of those happening at home. So what, what kind of opportunities do you think to are out there to educate the public that cardiac arrest is real? Um, and, and what's our opportunity? What can we gain from this? Right, right. I think that's an excellent point. So as you mentioned earlier, you know, cardiac arrest, you know, sudden cardiac arrest, which we hope to be able to recognize and treat and prevent from becoming sudden cardiac death, uh, there are about 350,000 events yearly. And so um, now th the chance of survival is 10 or 15% when this happens out of the hospital. Yet uh, effective CPR, early recognition and effective CPR, which is, you know, again, recognizing, uh, yeah. checking the patient, recognizing, calling for help, beginning chest compressions, uh, at a rate of 100 compressions an hour with both hands on the center of the chest, elbows locked, uh, that can double or triple the chance of survival. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we saw that yeah. uh, with Damar Hamlin. That is, uh, you know, credit to the trainers and the medical personnel yes. who recognize this and acted quickly with CPR, um, availability of an AED. Uh, to apply a um, pads to the chest to recognize a dangerous arrhythmia and deliver a defibrillating shock that can restore uh, the heartbeat back to normal from a dangerous arrhythmia. Doc, do you believe that? Um, do you believe that every public space entity should have an AED in place? Absolutely, uh, I think that. Uh, at uh, particularly, you know, not just at youth sports, high school yeah. sports, college sports, uh, obviously uh, in professional sports, they have uh, medical personnel or trainers on the sideline and they're all trained, but this should be 
at schools, churches, yeah. mosques, yeah. synagogues, yeah. Uh, restaurants, movie theaters, um, you know, public uh, venues. Yes, yeah. absolutely. AED should be available. What are your, what's your take? Do you think, let me ask you another question. Do you think CPR is the most important skill that a non-medical person should know? You know, the thing about CPR, the, the quick answer is yes. It, it's important and it's so simple. It's, you know, imagine if it was part of high school graduation that people learn effective CPR uh, or uh, patient, uh, p- people playing sports that all the, the, uh, the athletes participating on the team knew how to do CPR. Uh, so it, it is very important. And, you know, learning how to use an AED. Uh, studies have shown that sixth graders are very good at applying and activating an AED and knowing how to call for help. So uh, this is something that can be easily taught and should be uh, readily available. Yes. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for giving us some takes on just what happened. Let me ask you this one more question about the DeMar Hamlin situation again. Well, you know, but you've seen and treated people with sudden cardiac arrest. But um, generally speaking, what's the prognosis for someone who survives an out-of-hospital sudden cardiac arrest? Um, what are they looking like as far as recovery? Um, you know, how long is this journey for them to return to normal? And I use that word normal. I don't use it, use it lightly or anything like that. But, you know, what is normal? But, but what's the general prognosis? Right. Great question. And, you know, part of the survival of, you know, 10 or 15 percent. So people can... Uh, be resuscitated out in the field where you can have ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, however, the survival after the resuscitation to make it out of the hospital uh, depends on uh, how other organs were affected. Uh, so the reason the, this gets back to the importance of CPR, that effective chest compressions uh, will maintain some type of circulation to vital organs, particularly up to the brain. And so, um, you know, and that will, um, preserving and protecting uh, brain function and the function of other organs and allowing them to recover, that's part of the aftercare. The aftercare is sort of nursing the body and helping those other organs recover. And that's, that's the big, you know, that's one of the big influences on survival, the brains, the kidneys, the lungs, were they injured as a result of lack of perfusion, what we call a state of cardiac shock, where the other art organs aren't getting enough oxygen, were they damaged enough uh, to where they're permanently damaged or is there some type of recovery? Uh, and, and those are the important things and can determine somebody's survive, not only survival, but quality of life after yeah. survival and functionality after survival. I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Doc. Let's get into a section here that we do on Health 360 with Dr. G called Frequently Asked Questions. I always love doing this kind of stuff. But but again, people out there have questions and, and, and it's important for us as medical professionals to do our best to answer them. And I say for us, you know, I think for us as docs that I've known you enough and I know my patients that they'll just ask you questions and you're so receptive on answering them and taking time. So I really appreciate that. But I say, if you have a question, write it down talk to your doc and he or she can hopefully help you guide them along the way. So here's a couple of ones. So here's the first one. Uh, and you said it, but I'll have you say it again. So doc, how common is sudden cardiac arrest? Yeah. So the incidence uh, yearly is about 350,000 cases per year. All right. And I know that um, you were saying earlier that uh, the survival rate is only about 10% of victims uh, that unfortunately survive this. Uh, if certainly nothing is done. Uh, at all. That's correct. And CPR, effective, C- early and effective CPR can can double or triple sur- the survival rate. Mm. Out of curiosity, on that same note, on that same thing, let me pick back. If you do, um, C- you know, obviously double, triple with CPR, what about when you add an AED? How much does that increase the odds of survival as well, too? Do you get close to 50% potentially? You can, you can, with at, with an AED, you can, yes, you can approach 40% if there is a shockable rhythm that is recognized by the device and AEDs are very easy to learn, uh, to apply, turn them on. They will do the rhythm discrimination or recognition and apply and and then uh, deliver the appropriate therapy. But that can be uh, vital in 
uh, restoring a normal electrical signal of your heartbeat, which will then restore perfusion to the vital organs. Wonderful. Here's the next one. I like this one. Uh, does sudden cardiac arrest mostly affect the elderly? Yeah, good question. We uh, obviously focused on um, the incidents uh, with the with athletes, uh, which is again very pertinent to the moment. But it does it is more common uh, as we get older, and uh, I, I hate to say that uh, I, I might be approaching that elderly population. <laughs> the most common cause of cardiac arrest is starts with a plumbing problem, typically, which would be a blockage of an artery that could subsequently lead to uh, lack of uh, blood flow to a portion of the heart muscle. And as that heart muscle begins to sustain damage and injury, uh, that can lead to a, an electrical problem or a dangerous arrhythmia where the heart stops pumping, people can lose consciousness and stop breathing as we see uh, in cardiac arrest. So elderly people may be prone to it, which then gets back to how important it is for patients to start by seeing primary care physicians like you, for appropriate uh, evalu uh, yearly history and physicals, yes, focusing yes. on prevention and then appropriate referral to a specialist. You know, that's one of my, my things and, and it really starts to thank you for, <clears throat> for shouting out there for, for the uh, primary care physicians out there. Again, having that baseline, that foundational relationship with your primary care physician, your internist, your family, me family medicine doc, um, it's so crucial to get all that with Dr. What Dr. Sleem just said. So it's crucial just to get that history. But but we are here, like people know in my practice, I'm here for you as, as 24-7, 365 uh, to make sure that you are doing well. But getting an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There you go. That's our goal. So, you know, and actually getting back to that, we talked about incidents, yeah. just to elaborate on yeah, that. Please. You know, 350,000 uh, events uh, and half of those events that occur, the cardiac arrest was the sentinel, the primary, the main cardiac, the initial cardiac symptom. The other half, people were having subtle symptoms. And this is where it's important that when you have that close relationship with your primary care physician and the proper questions are asked, like, you know, are you getting short of breath with activity yes. easily? Are you yes. having any chest pain? Is there any family history? What are your risk factors? And do you need to be referred? So it's almost like a two-pronged approach that for those where it's the primary, the, the primary declaration or sentinel event of a cardiac episode, we talked about the importance of CPR, early recognition, chest compressions, mm -hmm. calling for help. But the other half, it's recognizing who is at risk from the symptoms and family history. And it starts by the relationship that they have with you uh, and then referral, an easy referral to people like us. Let's, let's dive into risk a little bit. Here's a freaking nice question. I'm skipping around a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, what are some risk factors for sudden cardiac arrest, generally speaking? Right. Well, things like, um, you know, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, obesity, uh, those are all uh, risk factors. Uh, genetics, which can affect cholesterol. And then we talked about other genetic disorders that might affect the heart muscle structurally and functionally. And then we talked about the electrical network of the heart, and there can be some genetic abnormalities where the electrical network may be vulnerable to arrhythmias as well. Appreciate it. Here we go. I like this question. I'll take this one. This will be for, for Dr. G. I like this one. Um, if he, again, I get all these ones. Here it is. If you encounter someone in sudden cardiac arrest, then what should you do? Here's the Dr. G approach. Uh, number one, call. Call 911 and follow the dispatcher instructions. Number two, push. Start CPR. Press hard and fast on the center of the chest at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. And number three, shock and use the nearest AED as quickly as possible. Again, call, push, shock, and help will be on the way. And, and just what you're trying to do as a bystander is just to keep things going until the emergency medical services uh, uh, team arrives and can take over. But what we want to do is certainly have bystanders be aware. And that's why it's so important is we're looking at this and is there a catalyst doc? You know, what can we do as we're watching this on, on, foot, on national TV? What can I do? Um, and I say to people, take a CPR class. You know, if you have somebody that's got risk in your house, a family member that has some of those risk factors, maybe a CPR class. 
So those right. are the things that we can do. I appreciate it. Doc, here's a good question for you. Um, I like this one. What are, oh, wait, we did that one already. I like this one. Here it is. Are there any ways to prevent sudden cardiac arrest? Let's dive into that a little bit more about the prevention thing. You, you talked about, of course, having a relationship with your doc, making sure those conditions are controlled, but is there anything else that people can do to lower their risk? Right. So that, that gets into screening. And so uh, again, screening people for risk factors. So you know, when you, when you have a relationship with a pr primary care physician, they will start by asking the patient their personal story. Do they have a story of symptoms? Uh, what are their risk factors by running some uh, lab tests? What are their, what is their immediate family history? Anybody, are they related to anybody who might've uh, died before the age of 40 at a young age? Uh, the other screening aspect that um, I believe is helpful uh, but is somewhat controversial uh, is uh, a routine screening ECG for young athletes. Uh, there's a program in, in within our communities called Young Hearts for Life that has gone to local schools and screened young athletes with an ECG. Um, and th the controversy that surrounds that is that, you know, there's close to 500,000 athletes nationally reading ECGs sometimes may not be fully standardized. Uh, there may be a lot of false positives, which can create a lot of its own uh, anxiety and distress for patients. But I do believe that uh, as a the screening tool that we have currently to identify things like uh, for possibly an enlarged heart muscle that would indicate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, it might find uh, something like long QT syndrome. Uh, it, it might find a, a condition called WPW, another ECG uh, anomaly that might put somebody at risk. Um, I think in the future, uh, there may be some AI algorithms that can make ECGs a little bit more uh, detailed, pick up things that the human eye may not see consistently and reliably uh, that can make that screening more effective. <clears throat> You know, I was just talking to a patient of mine earlier today about uh, kind of a kind of like what's what's health going to look like in the next 10 years by the end of this decade. And we were talking about wearables and and right now kind of wearables are kind of like PRN uh, as needed or ad hoc. But I do believe you. I want to pick back on that. I do believe that there could be some sort of algorithms like before somebody comes into my office, I will have not only their their cardiac activity. Um, from a device, uh, their oxygen levels. Obviously, I, I'll even have their sleep habits and their sleep stages, and that can stuff can be in my in my electronic medical record before the person even steps in, so you can intervene earlier. But but I think you're going to see more continuous um, um, metrics that'll be applied. We're just not there yet. Uh, you know, somebody might give you like a strip because they have the software on their phone that says I could do an ECG, uh, but 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 not necessarily continuous. But I think it's going to be an exciting time for some of the wearables that are out there for cardiology that may help answer this question. Again, why, you know, what do we do with kids and youth? Should they, they're all wearing watches. You know, can we, can we uh, take advantage of that? Yes, I think, you know, for example, if you start with a 12 the ECG, it's, it's, it's our current screening tool for uh, school athletes and many other individuals. And, and it's a very important tool to identify a, a, a disorder of a heartbeat. It's an important tool to recognize um, chest pain that might be associated with a heart attack in the emergency room. But, you know, again, the effectiveness of it as a tool to screen somebody who might be at risk, uh, it's the tool that we have and it can be very helpful. But there are studies showing that artificial intelligence can now identify left ventricular dysfunction on an ECG. So, you know, for the audience, uh, it can recognize weakening of the heart muscle, which can be a risk for uh, sudden cardiac arrest on an ECG. There have been other studies that have uh, applied that algorithm to wearables. An Apple Watch, for example, is a lead one single lead ECG recording. Yeah. And some artificial intelligence studies have now been able to uh, identify that. So to your point, in the next two years, uh, I think artificial intelligence and wearables uh, are going to um, are, are going to definitely be part of um, patients' wellness and screening yes. uh, and disease management. 
I, I want the kind of stuff, but me, I'm kind of a, a geek, geek in heart, you know, kind of thing. So it's like, this is like the stuff where, you know, it's like, oh man, I'm so excited where medicine is going and how we can really take things to the next level and really allow for people to have tools for success, truly tools uh, for success as well, too. So I appreciate that. So doc, let me ask you this question. Let's do a couple more FAQs. I like this one here. Um, do AEDs replace the use of CPR? They, uh, that's a great question. Um, so they, they don't replace CPR. They are part of uh, uh, a resuscitative effort, so to speak. So uh, CPR should be started and continued until an AED is available mm -hmm. and until an AED is applied. And then after an AED is determined if therapy is necessary or not, at that point, a uh, person should be reevaluated to see if CPR needs to be continued. So it's sort of a, uh, uh, it, it goes in conjunction uh, as a supplement to resuscitative efforts. And here we go. I like this one. Here's a nice FAQ. We'll do a couple more of these. Should I have an AED in my home? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, listen, I, I think it's, it may not be a bad idea. There was talk, um, uh, you know, just like we have fire extinguishers yeah. in our home, yeah. uh, I have some of my partners that just, you know, they they have AEDs in the in the trunks of their cars, and sure enough, they've they've had to use them. So I think just like people have fire extinguishers, uh, an AED readily available uh, is is probably a good idea. I appreciate it. Thank you. Here we go. A couple more of these. I like this. Um, after resuscitation, will the survivor be able to resume a normal life? Great question. And that's what we all certainly hope yeah. for. Yeah. Um, you know, similarly, we, we, uh, we hope for uh, uh, people to return to their full functional uh, capacity. And then again, that gets back to the effectiveness of CPR to improve chances of survival. But it depends on the, the aftercare recovery of not just the heart muscle, but all the other organs and how they're able to uh, re recover their functionality. So it, it probably depends on some degree to a person's occupation to begin with. Um, but, but the idea and the goal is yes, uh, to restore that as much as possible. Excellent. Hey, everybody, you're joining me here on Health 360 with Dr. G. I'm sitting down with Dr. Moeen Salim, a cardiac electrophysiologist, and we're talking sudden cardiac arrest. And so uh, we do something each episode of, of Health 360 with Dr. G, Doc, we do something called myths versus facts. And that's when we set the record straight. So here's what we'll do in this section. I love this section. One of the signature pieces of my show is that I will say a statement, and then you, my friend, will say myth or fact. And then I'll say, like, please explain. Uh, but again, send the record straight so people have the right information. Again, if there's any questions, talk to your doc. I cannot state that even more, more enough. It's important to have that relationship. And again, we're here to help you be the best version of yourself. So, But at the same time, got to dispel myths. So here it is. Doc, first statement here. Here's a statement. I'll read it. If you tell me myth or fact. All right, here we go. Survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest largely depends on immediate action by people nearby who recognize the life-threatening emergency and decide to help. Myth or fact? Please explain. It's a fact. As we stated earlier, uh, early recognition, CPR, calling for help can double or triple the chance of survival. All right, here we go. I like this one. Myth or fact, please explain. Sudden cardiac arrest is rare. Well, it's 350,000 times uh, or, or events mm -hmm. in a year. So mm -hmm. I, I think while we saw this rare event on TV and it caught our attention, uh, I'm going to say that's a myth. Yeah, I would agree. You know, I had a doc, and I remember this telling me, uh, telling me for it was uh, one of our uh, electrophysiologists from my uh, train at Loyola. And I remember, I can't, of course, I can't remember the doc's name to save the life of me, but I do remember the analogy. And he did, he said something like uh, the number of people uh, that die from sudden cardiac arrest every day is equivalent, equivalent to the number of people that would be on two jumbo airplanes that crashed and there were no survivors. And when you kind of put that into, uh, into context, this is the enormity of the challenge that we see the health, the sudden cardiac arrest is a major public health problem. And you're trying, I know you and your colleagues, you know, have dealt with people and I've tried to help people from a preventative standpoint is how can we make 
this less of an issue? Or if we, if somebody does have an issue, how can we make sure that bystanders know CPR and have AEDs available to help save lives? So yeah, exactly. Crazy. Yes. Here's the next one. I like this one. Myth for fact. Please explain, Doc. Here it is. When people have heart attacks, they are awake and their hearts are beating. When people have sudden cardiac arrest, they are not awake and their hearts are not beating. Myth or fact? Please explain. Yeah, well, well that's, that's, uh, that's a fact. Um, when people have a heart attack and they're awake, they can have all the symptoms and sensations of chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, uh, pain going to their jaw or shoulder or into their back. Uh, whereas cardiac arrest, uh, people, uh, they, 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 they will lose consciousness. They will not appear to be breathing. And if you try to check for a pulse, you will not find the pulse. Here we go. I like this one. Mr. Fab, please explain. Sudden cardiac arrest only happens to the elderly. Uh, that is a myth. Uh, it uh, is more frequent in the elderly population, but as we've talked about, while it is a lower incidence in younger people, there are conditions where younger people can be predisposed to it. Thank you. Here we go. Next one here. I like this one, Doc. Here it is. Mr. Fab, please explain. Sudden cardiac arrest only happens to people with a history of heart problems. Myth of fact, please explain. Yeah, that is a, uh, that, that's a myth also. Uh, there are risk factors where people can be prone to cardiac conditions. Uh, and then there's certain cardiac conditions that may be more common than others, but there can be other causes of uh, people to have what appears to be an arrest. Uh, somebody could, could have, <clears throat> could have had a stroke. They could have had uh, some type of aneurysm, whether it's an aneurysm in the chest or an aneurysm in the brain, uh, things like a, a blood clot, a large blood clot that goes uh, up uh, and circulates into the lungs called a pulmonary embolus uh, can also cause a cardiac arrest. So uh, it's not just uh, a cardiac issue that can be associated with that. You know, Doc, I like what you were saying a little bit earlier about how, you know, if somebody were to present um, uh, from an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and present it to the hospital and, and you and your team are working with them, you guys have an exhaustive list that you guys are trying to run through uh, of what could have been this. And it's almost like, as you're saying, you know, sometimes maybe... The, you know, yes, they had the cardiac arrest, but that could be the indic an indicator that there was an, a problem that just finally presented to itself in the form of a cardiac arrest. If you're working up, as you mentioned, like a pulmonary embolism or, uh, you know, uh, cardiomyopathy or other kind of disorders that you see, heart attack, stroke. That's absolutely right. You know, when something like this happens, uh, the immediate attention is uh, towards the efforts of resuscitation mm -hmm. And once we have ROSC, um, return of spontaneous circulation and hemodynamic stability, there's a checklist of the why. And the purpose of that is, uh, you know, what to do next, how to prevent this from happening. So we work on helping the patient recover, uh, and then we want to prevent it from happening again. And uh, maybe go further and identify any other family members that might be at risk and prevent it uh, from happening to them. Excellent. Let's do a couple more of these. I like this one. Here it is. Um, I'll do this one. Uh, this will be for Dr. G. I'll give this is an easy one. Here we go. For Dr. G, here it is. Automated external defibrillators, AEDs, are life-saving devices with visual and voice prompts that are designed for use by laypersons. That is a fact. You do not have to be a trained medical professional to use an AED. All right, Dr. Salim, I'll give you back to the hard ones again. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> you like that? I give us something really easy one. Here it is, Dr. Salim, back to you. I like this one. AEDs can hurt people by shocking them inappropriately. Myth or fact, please explain. Uh, that is a myth. Uh, when an AED is very, e it's very easy to learn uh, to apply to a patient. And um, it can, uh, then the AED has automated um, messaging to the person that applies it with clear instructions uh, for their safety uh, and then also for the appropriate therapy uh, of the patient. All right, here we go. We'll do two more of these. I like this one. Here it is, Dr. Celine. This one's for you. I could be sued for intervening with a sudden cardiac arrest patient. Myth or fact, please explain. That is a myth. Uh, there is a good Samaritan law that protects people uh, who um, uh, step up and, and help those who um, uh, appear to be uh, suffering or appear to have had a cardiac arrest. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, I will say this. Um, I, I feel like um, 
you know, those Good Samaritan laws are in all 50 states. There's no doubt about that. But it's almost like, you know, I think the, the, the and, you know, I'm not going to get into too much conjecture, but the fact that somebody has a sudden cardiac arrest, they're virtually, you know, virtually dead in an, an extent. So, so by helping out and doing nothing, you can't make the situation any worse. Uh, correct? No. No, that's yeah, correct. And they're clean, not clean, in any clean. position to give consent for anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they, uh, so no, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, let's see this last one. This is for you, my friend. Last one versus fact, here it is. If you live with someone who is at risk for sudden cardiac arrest, then it's important that you be trained in CPR. Myth or fact, please explain. Uh, well, I, you know, I think that uh, the moment that we're in is an opportunity to remind everybody uh, the importance of getting trained and educated in CPR. Knowledge is power, and 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 an opportunity to educate our community um, is 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 here. So I agree. Well, thank you, Doc. So, Doc, we have about five minutes left, and like time has flown by really fast. But this has just been great discussion. You know, so when we called in the beginning, we called the chief complaint again. What should the public know about? Uh, sudden cardiac arrest and why it's so important to to know about CPR, to know about uh, uh, AEDs. In the end, we call that the assessment and plan. And that's, of course, when we give our patients a diagnosis, we give them a treatment plan, and most importantly, we schedule a follow-up. So Dr. Salim, give us a few take-home points. You know, people that have been listening to this to this podcast, what are some take-home points? What's the importance? What's the kind of call to action you would, you would give to people moving forward about awareness on sudden cardiac arrest? Yeah, I think education is, uh, is very important. Uh, you know, again, learning CPR. If um, you're part of a community, you want to know CPR. If you're, you or a family member are uh, part of a, a sports team, uh, you want to make sure that the resources are available in the public community, that there's an emergency action plan uh, should something like this happen. Screening. And that starts with a good relationship and good rapport with your primary care physician so that uh, uh, you can have a chance for somebody to hear your story and deconstruct it and list the risk factors to prevent this from happening again. And then the specialist can look into detail at the specific cardiac issues that need uh, further treatment and prevention. And then finally, as you and I talked about, we're really excited about the future. Um, the future of artificial intelligence, the future of wearables, where patients can be engaged in their health, not just locally, but globally in our communities. I mean, we're blessed to live and work at Edward Hospital, but there's areas around the city where there's healthcare disparity, global healthcare disparity, and things like wearables uh, can, can certainly be life-changing for, for people who don't have some of the opportunities that we have. Uh, so those are my takeaways. Um, and oh, thank you, you again for inviting me and having this discussion. I appreciate you. And especially what you said at the end about just having equity. We wanted that could be a game changer to help, to help populations that really, really need some critical services and just make it equitable. And so I know that's, that's what, that, that is so important on what we do again, help people helping people. So uh, before we get into my final thoughts, we're going to do a section here that's called listener healthy. Oh yeah. Content. So here's a quote from loyal <clears throat> listener TM. Here's a quote. I'm trying not to feel guilty about taking breaks. They're good, beneficial, and if done properly, can make the productive times more productive. So thank you, TM. And that was in relation to, I put out a, I put out a message to my followers on the socials to say, what, you know, tell me some examples of self-care. So thank you, TM, for giving us your take on self-care. And again, I genuinely enjoy hearing about your journey. And with your permission, of course, I'll read on the show. Simply message me across all the socials at Health360, WWG, and who knows? Your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. Sudden cardiac arrest requires emergency medical care at a hospital. If the heart is quickly restored, then survival is possible. Taking time to learn CPR and how to use an AED could mean the difference between life and death for a loved one. As a society, we must remain committed to increasing awareness of sudden cardiac arrest and the importance of immediate bystander action. The more people know how to respond to a heart emergency, the greater the survival rate. Imagine the countless lives we could save. So I wanna thank my guest today, 
Dr. Moeen Salim, double board certified cardiologist, uh, cardiac electrophysiologist with Midwest Cardiovascular Institute, also the director of the electrophysiology lab at Edward Hospital. Dr. Salim, thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the discussion. All right. And of course, you and I, we will, we will be connecting soon, of course. Hey, uh, right. you've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2023, Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all the socials at health 360 G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, Peace out.